it, uh, sorry, I did it again. Um, the probability of the union of these things occurring is nothing but the union of their probabilities, right? So again, if you wanted to know what's the probability I roll a one, two, or three, just add the probability you roll up a one, two, or three. The intersection of these things, because they're disjoint, has to be zero. Because you can't, can't have more than one thing occurring at a time if they're disjoint sets. Okay, can we have some examples here soon? My neck's actually hurting. I'll move up here. All right. So this is, this is the, why I introduced the idea of the complement. This is very important. So if someone asked you, um, what's the probability of, so AJ is an event, okay? What's the probability of AJ, anything but AJ occurring? It's one minus the probability that the event AJ occurs. So like if you wanted to calculate, what's the probability I'll roll a one, two, three, four, or five? You could add up all those probabilities or you could just subtract one minus the probability you'll roll a six. Right? So sometimes it's much easier to calculate the probability of the complement than the probability of the thing that you actually are interested in. So it just is easy. You'll see it in a minute. Um, okay, we've already covered that, I think. So here, so mutually exclusive events, that again means there's no way for A1, A2, so on to occur at the same time. If I want to calculate the probability that I get either, right, because union, either A1, A2, A3, and so on, I just add up their probabilities. If these things are not mutually exclusive, that means you can have A1 and A2 occurring at the same time, potentially, in one experiment, which I'll give you an example of in a minute. Um, that's what we call an arbitrary event, okay? So these events are arbitrary. So if you, you want to know what's the probability that I'll get either A1 or A2, then you take the probability you get A1 plus the probability you get A2 and then you have to subtract off the intersection. Otherwise you're adding things multiple times. So maybe this is easiest to show with a little picture. I think this is in the book. So here's a set A, let's call it A1. Here's a set A2 and they have this intersection right there. Okay. And you want to know what's the probability of getting A1 or A2 so you take the probability of A1, which is, let's say, that thing. You take the probability of A2, which is that thing. But now you've double counted that area right there. So you've got to subtract that off. That's the, that's the intersection of the two sets. Otherwise, you've counted that thing twice, which you don't want to do. Okay? So that's why that comes up. Okay. Um, they have things called conditional probabilities. So what this means is, what's the probability of A2 occurring given that A1 has already occurred? But that implies that they're related to each other, right? That somehow A1 occurring, whoops, almost fell over. Um, A1 occurring influences whether A2 occurs, okay? So the definition of that is you take the probability of the intersection of those two and then you divide by the probability of, of uh, A1 occurring. So again, what this means is, first of all, A1 has occurred. You want to know now what's the probability of A2 occurring, okay? If these things are independent, okay, hopefully you can appreciate it. If these two, if A1 and A2 are independent of each other, then it doesn't make any difference if A1's occurred first as to whether A2 will occur. That's what we mean by independent, okay? So that's what this says here. So if you're interested in what is the probability um, of, I'm using this equation here, what's the probability of either A1 or A2 occurring? simply the probability of A1 occurring times the probability of A2 occurring. It doesn't, it doesn't, this conditional probability doesn't matter, okay? So this is just meant to, we don't use this a lot, so I'm not going to focus on it too much, but this is just to cover the, the case where two things are related to each other and the probability of A2 occurring is different depending on whether A1 has occurred or not, okay? We'll come back to this maybe a couple of times, but not too much. Okay, so here's some examples. Um, these are not chemical <laughs> engineering examples, but at least they illustrate the points, okay? So someone asked you this question. You can impress people. Um, wait a minute, you guys are too young. Never mind. I always have to think what age are the students as to what kind of jokes I can make. Okay. So the joke I was about to make is not appropriate because you guys are not 21 yet. All right. So what's the probability that, you, so what are you doing? You're, you're tossing five coins. What's the probability you'll get heads at least once? Okay. So that means you could get it once, twice, three times, four times, or five times. So see, the idea here is, what's the number of possible outcomes? Well, 
you, you're flipping five coins and there's two possibilities, so there's 32 possible outcomes, you get it? Heads, 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 tails. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to enumerate them all, but you, hopefully you can see what I'm talking about. The probability of each of these occurring, we're assuming, are equal, right? Because there's no bias in the coins, is 1 over 32 for any particular combination. Okay? What's the probability that you'll get no heads? That's actually the complement, right? Because we want to ask the questions, wh what's the probability we'll get heads at least once? So rather than do that, I'm going to calculate the probability we don't get any heads at all. That's 1 over 32, because that's just one of these possible outcomes, right? That's all tails. So what's the probability you'll get at least, now you use this formula, this relation. What's the probability you'll get at least one head? Is 1 minus the probability you'll get none. Okay. So this is an example where it's just easier to calculate the probability of the complement set rather than the set itself. That's 31 over 32. All right. Someone asked you this question. I don't know why people are asking you these kind of questions, but they are. Okay. They say, I'm going to roll some dice. Okay. I want to know what's the probability that I'll get an odd number, right, 1, 3, or 5, or a number less than 4, 1, 2, and 3, okay, from a single toss of the dice. So hopefully you can see these two sets are not disjoint because what number odd and so 3 and 1 belong to both sets. See, so that's where this idea of intersection comes in. So what's the probability of an odd number? Well, there's three odd numbers, there's six possibilities, so it's 3, 6, or 1 half. What's the probability it'll be less than 4? 1, 2, or 3, also 3, 6. What's the probability it'll be both? 2, 6, right? Because I already told you, 1 and 3 are in both sets. So that's this right here. And so what's the probability of either? Right? So you, there's where you have to use this idea that sets aren't disjoint. So take the probability of getting A, probability of getting B, that's 3, 6 plus 3, 6, right? If you didn't subtract this off, then someone asked you this question, what's the probability this will happen? You would say 100, 100. it's 1. It's not, <laughs> there's no other possibility. What if they say, what if I roll a 5? You're like, I'm not considering that, <laughs> all right? Um, all right. So that's why it's critical you subtract off the intersection, then you get 2 thirds. Okay, so that eliminates the possibility of 5 and 6, because they don't satisfy this. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, the way to think about these permutations and combinations I'm about to explain is that this is how you calculate the number of possible events, right? Because right now it's easy, I tell you, oh, we flip a coin five times, well, you can calculate that pretty easily. Or, I roll a dice one time, obviously there's six possibilities, six possible outcomes, that's not hard to figure out. But sometimes it is a little harder to figure out, and that's where permutations and combinations are handy. Okay, so the difference between permutation and combination is in a permutation, the arrangement of the objects matter. Okay? So, for example, in a permutation, ABC is different than ACB. But in a combination, they're the same thing, because order doesn't matter in a combination. Okay? So if you have n different objects, the number of permutations, number of different ways they can be arranged without reg with, with regard to order is n factorial. Okay. So for example, if you want to know why the, the um, alphabet is so useful, you could calculate 26 factorial. Right? There's a lot of, lot of ways to use it. Okay. So when it, the, we have to get the notation. So it's the number of permutations of n objects taken all at a time. So that means um, I'm kind of considering them one by one, which I'll explain in a minute. Oh, here, I can explain it here. So the number, so in this case, the th formula is slightly different. So this is the number of permutations or possibilities. You have n objects again, but then they're divided into some, somehow they're divided into classes, okay? So, for example, in the alphabet, A, B, C, D, they're all different, right? So there's no real concept of putting them in a class. But if you, for some bizarre reason, said, I don't want to consider A, B, and C any different from each other, then that would be one class that contains A, B, and C. That will reduce the number of possibilities, right? Because if A is no different than B is no different than C, that's going to give you less possibilities. And this ends up being the formula, okay? And factorial again, but then you have the factorial involving the size of these different classes. And I'm going to give you examples of all these in a minute, okay? <coughs> And by definition here, the number of objects in each class has to add up to the total, right? Otherwise, this doesn't make sense. Okay, or you can do number of permutations of n objects taken k at a time, okay? So, 
uh, let me, I'll get to an example of this, to much meatier with the example, but so in this case you have to consider whether you're going to allow things to be repeated or not. So um, when you have repetitions, you use this formula. When you don't have repetitions, you use this formula. So let me, let me just go through some, I'll probably go through the examples and then come back so you can, ex you can see more clearly what I'm talking about. Now we've been <coughs> reduced to playing with balls. You know, we're moving backward in our educational development and now we're We've been put in a room with six red balls and four blue balls, okay? <laughs> We're concerned, because at least in my case, I'm 52 years old and I'm not really sure why someone's doing this to me. But anyway, <laughs> um, once I get sufficiently old, I'll probably want to play with red and blue balls again. I just need another 30 years. All right, um, so I want to calculate the probability of the following occurring. What's the probability that I'll remove all the red balls first and then the blue balls later? So I, in other words, I have to sam I'm sampling these balls. There's 10 of them. I want to know what it, what's the likelihood that I'll remove all six first before I even touch a blue one. Your intuition should tell you it's not very likely, right? At least I hope that's what it tells you. So this is where the classes come in. So we have 10 total. Six of them are red, four of them are blue, okay? And so now I want to know what's the probability that I'm going to remove all six and then the four. Okay, that's one possible outcome. So. This formula is maybe not all that clear. The first thing I'm doing here is I'm calculating what is the total number of possibilities, okay? So just don't worry about this formula. I'm trying to explain the denominator. So I'm saying if I have six of this, four of these, what's the total number of permutations? And for that, I'm using this formula right here, right? It's 10 factorial divided by six factorial times four factorial, okay? That's the total number of possibilities. So in other words, if I have six red balls and four blue balls, there's a lot of different ways I could remove them. A lot of different possibilities, okay? I'm interested in just one possibility, that the first six are red and the last four are blue, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my one possibility and divide it by all the other number of possibilities to calculate the probabilities. Does that make sense to you? Okay, yeah? Yeah, so for example, if I could ask the question, what's the probability I'll remove all the blue balls and then the red balls, but I'm going to take the red balls two at a time. That, that changes the probability of it occurring. Okay, so will, it doesn't mean like taking one at a time. This, one, this, yeah, oh sorry. This, this does kind of mean taking one at a time, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. All right, so, so if you look at the number of possibilities, that's here, n factorial divided, so that's 10 factorial divided by 6 times 4. You take 1 over that, that's the probability of the one thing you're interested in occurring, it's not surprising, small, half a percent. Not very likely that'll occur, okay? If you're interested, okay, I got a new thing now. Um, do you ever see A Beautiful Mind? You, you've seen this movie? Okay. Okay. <laughs> if, you, if you did, you know what I'm talking about, otherwise you just want me to continue. All right. So. Here's what we're going to do. We have, we're going to form a bunch of five letter words, right? We have an alphabet to do it with and we want to know how many different words we can form, okay? So N is 26, right? There's 26 possible letters. Now we're taking them five at a time, right? Because each word has to have five letters, okay? We're not interested in taking them one at a time, but five at a time, okay? So then we use this, sorry, to flip back and forth. Now we use this formula here, okay? So by not, by, when I say not allowing repetitions, I mean we're not allowing a word to have the same letter twice, okay? So once we use A, we can only use it once, okay? So the number of possibilities is the number of letters times the number of um, letters in the word. It's, it's, you know, 12 million possibilities, so not bad. If, if um, oh, sorry, I lied. In this case, <laughs> sorry with repetitions, I misread this, so obviously in this case we're allowing repetitions, so we could, in this case you could have a word A, 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 fine, okay. If you only allow the letter to be used one time, then use the other formula, which is right here, and then you can see you reduced what, by a factor of, I don't know, 50%, the number of possibilities, okay? Still plenty, no, all right? So again, the main reason <laughs> we're interested in these kind of combinations and, or permutations when I'll talk about next combinations so we can calculate the probability of something we're interested in occurring because we're talking about probabilities, okay? 
combinations um, very similar except the difference now is that order doesn't make any difference okay so we're not worried about how things are ordered so if you're talking about letters to you the a b c is the same as c b a it's the same thing because order does not matter okay to explain this we introduce these things called binomial coefficients they're simply a definition okay this is for real numbers, we only really care about integers, so if you look at this formula, so if I give you this notation n, you know, print the n over k, that means it's shorthand for this, this right here, okay? And if n is an integer, then you can express this formula right there as this. That's not true if a is a real number, but it, if a is an integer, you can, if a is an integer called n, then you can calculate this. It's implicit in this that n is uh, greater than or equal to k. Okay? All right. So the reason these are useful is because you can define the number of combinations that might occur using these coefficients. So this is the same kind of thing as I talked about before. If we, if we have n objects, we want to take them k at a time. I told you the number of permutations. Now it's the number of combinations. Obviously, number of combinations is going to be less right because order doesn't matter and if you call ABC the same as CBA that will reduce the number of possibilities so the number of um, combinations of n objects taken k at a time if you don't allow repetitions is this okay and if you do allow repetition it's this okay so hopefully you can appreciate this is off the topic Ted, that it's useful to have the notes like you can copy all this stuff down but I don't really worry about going slow enough where you can. <laughs> okay, and the, the reasoning for that is because I assume you can get the notes um, and you're, you know, so just be assured, and this is um, trying to reassure you, if, if I go through the slides you're not able to copy all these formulas, they're, they're available, you can download them. So I wouldn't really spend a lot of time copying all these formulas, but it's, you know, you might want to make notes on what I'm saying to the extent that you think it's useful, or I see this guy's wise, he's, got, he's printed out the notes. Let's so print them out, make, make, complimenting you. Doesn't know I'm talking about him. <laughs> there he does. Yeah, he noticed. All right. Um, so it's, it's easier just to probably take notes, right? You know, write your comments right on the notes. And, but it's, it's totally up to you. Do you guys still have a big, like, printing quota thing each semester? For how much stuff you can print? Or it's, for like ECS? What? 100 pages, at the library. 100 pages a, a semester? Is that what it is? That's pretty, that's pretty low, <laughs> okay, because I'm, I'm alone going to give you like t over 200 pages of notes probably, so anyway. Go to Kinko's, pay some more money, all right. Oh, okay, free printing in the crib, all right. All right, so let's see how we use this thing, okay. So let's say we have um, three letters, A, B, C. We want to take them two at a time. In other words, we, we're, not, we're not a very sophisticated society. We've only come up with three letters currently. And we want to know how many words we can form if we have two letters each. Okay? So N is three, right? Three, po th th three letters total. We're taking them two at a time, so K is two. We use this formula here. If you were to calculate this out, it's three. Obviously, you can enumerate. The number is so low, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out um, the possibilities are A, B, A, C, and B, C. That's the only three, okay? And so because we're talking about combinations, B, A doesn't count, right? Because B, A is the same as A, B, all right? Obviously, the value of using these formulas is that you don't have to enumerate all the possibilities, right? That's pretty, as you'll see in a minute, <laughs> pretty painful at times, okay? Now, if you allow repetitions, okay, which means that you still consider you know, A, B, and B, A to be the same, because that's what a combination is, but you'll allow each letter to be used twice if you want, you'll get six more words in your, or sorry, three more words in your language, right? If you use this formula, calculate, you'll see six, and I just enumerated those are the six possibilities. Now, this is the old light bulb joke, perhaps, I'm not sure, but, um, so, we have 500 light bulbs, and we take them five at a time, so in other words, you have a, for whatever reason, you have 500 light bulbs available, you take 500 of these at a time, and then you ask how many possible ways are there to take these light bulbs? And the answer is there's a lot. Okay, first of all, I say repetition is not possible because the light bulbs are, um, are, all, are all the same to begin with, so it doesn't make sense to talk about repetition, okay, unlike letters. 
So if you use this formula, 500 taken five at a time, you, you, you could be doing this for quite some time because there's apparently 255 billion possibilities of doing that, okay? All right, so, um, hey, that's awesome. That was kind of my dream and it came true. Um, so, the, so the point of today's lecture, I have to be frank with you, is to, uh, is to lay some groundwork for probability. Um, this wasn't meant to be, it was, it was called probability theory for a reason, okay? So we come back next time, I'll start talking about probability distributions and normal distributions and things like that. We'll start seeing how you actually work with data.